Thank you. So we will start the eighth session, session and uh, we have we will start with uh, uh, Michal Prohaska from CISNET with the Czech uh, uh, NRN. So he will present you present us the CISNET uh, NRN. Okay. So good afternoon. My name is Michal Prohaska. And I've been asked to talk about the Cessnet services with the Czech, which is Czech and RAN. Well, I'm not any official representative of Cessnet. I'm not CEO, nothing like that. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, uh, network identity department. And I'm here to do the identity federation and room training tomorrow and on, on Sunday. So if I'm here, I... I uh, I've been asked to talk about the uh, Cessnet services. Just a uh, little brief well, information what Cessnet is. Uh, Cessnet is an uh, association of universities of the Czech Republic and Academy of Science. It has been founded by, by Czech universities. And it's a single and run in Czech Republic, which is not the case in all the countries around Europe. And uh, I can say it's much simpler to have just one and run in the country to make all the things simpler, even uh, how to get the money. And uh, Cessnet is supported also by the government. It's paid uh, one third of the money, not exactly, but uh, one third of the income is made by the member fees by the member universities. Uh, the second part is uh, paid by the government, and the last part is uh, the income from the uh, EU and local project where we uh, are partners. So here's the list of current Cessnet users, uh, uh, the, the, the users of our services. Uh, we have about 26 public universities there, two state universities and eight private. This is not the old list, some of the private universities are not connected yet. There are 50, uh, 54 academic of science, some research institutes and uh, 47 research infrastructures. We have, also, uh, we have also connected several, very, very, very few of primary schools and secondary schools, but uh, the plan is to connect all of them, of course. We also have the hospitals, which are faculty hospitals and other medical uh, facilities. This is mainly for educational purposes, uh, because we are providing the, the infrastructure for doing the uh, uh, virtual, uh, I can say virtual surgery, so, so students do not need to be uh, in place where is the surgery done so they can watch it uh, via the uh, high definition and uncompressed video so it's high quality so they feel like to be there but they are not to be uh, there physically. We also have the connected libraries and museum galleries. Uh, they are, uh, the main reason is because they would like to access the, uh, the, the, con the, the, uh, well, the op op open data content on these kind of things. And of course we have some uh, government institutions connected because they would like to be connected to the internet, of course, and they would like to use some of the, our services. So here is the big picture of the, the Cessnet, uh, Cessnet network. Uh, we are very heavily populated in Czech Republic, so we need to have a lot of lines there. Uh, the, uh, the orange one lines are the, the, this is the core network. Uh, which is done in the in the circles, so it's it's uh, completely backup. We have of course some connections to the outside world, to all the uh, uh, neighbored countries like the uh, Akonet in in Austria, the Sunnet in Slovakia, Pioneer in in, in Poland, and also uh, uh, lines to the Giant, public internet, and uh, M6, which, which is the uh, the internet exchange in Netherlands. We have also the uh, the NIX, I'm not sure whether it's 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 uh, open exchange point, but I guess yes, it's it's local uh, Czech uh, exchange point. So the traffic going from Czech Republic to Czech Republic do not need to go uh, to outside world. And we have actually 55, 55 locations. So I guess you can remember the picture right now. Uh, so the orange one is is based on the uh, DWDM technology. So we have 100 gig in the core network and uh, 10 gig to all the universities, big universities and hospitals, and the rest is, is uh, uh, 
well, these using the, the one gig and probably some of them are connected by, by uh, one holiday. On the next slide, there, there is the, the graph, which, uh, well, I can describe it here. Uh, we, we can divide our customers and partners into two big groups. Uh, one which covers about 55% of our partners are connected uh, uh, with the connection less than 100 uh, megabits. And this mostly secondary primary schools and some, some uh, institutes from, from culture and uh, public administration, and they are just connected. They are using just Cessnet, uh, Cessnet network. And the rest, which is about 45%, are connected via our network and also use the advanced services like this uh, data storage, computing, collaboration, and security. And they are connected with more than one gig, usually with 10 to 40 gigs. Uh, then, as the Cessnet is the research infrastructure, uh, we are uh, well, well, so we are trying to be part of the uh, big research project and then well let our universities to be part of that project as well but through the system so do, they do not need to be part directly with the research projects and we are somehow like s s some mediator and we are providing also the knowledge of our people to, to, to this project so as an one example, big example is the, that uh, we are part of the Jean project, which provides the, not just the, the connectivity, but also some advanced services like uh, identity, security, and these kind of things. Uh, we are also uh, somehow connected with US Internet 2 and with Cliff. On the other side, on the right side of the picture, there is the Praise. So we have some high performance computing, so we are connected to, to the project Praise like for example the IT for Innovation project in Czech Republic uh, which has this one, one of the biggest supercomputer uh, in Czech Republic and also there are some other projects like uh, Solid Science Cloud and Cessnet itself which is connected to the EGI which is the European Grid Infrastructure which provides uh, access to the uh, uh, distributed grid infrastructure for, for the researchers all around the world and here is also the list of other projects we are part of and this means that the, our universities and uh, academic staff can, can be part of, of this, of, uh, this uh, project uh, through, through this assessment. So, and it covers all the areas from the uh, IT research to life science and um, medical science and uh, uh, even some, some projects from the uh, climate changes uh, research and, and, and these kind of things. So this is the how the services of Cessnet are, are built. So on, on, on the bottom we have the shared communication infrastructure which is just the network with some, some, some advanced features but from, from the point of view of the partner it's just a network, it's just a connectivity. On top of the connectivity and network we have the data storage services, high performance computing and collaboration services as a big box which are provided uh, for the institution and then can select which one of them, probably all of them uh, they, they, they would like to use. And on top of that, we have provided, it's called the security, so, so we would like to only provide in, in secure manner the services, so there is the, the proper authentication and authorization of the users. Uh, I will talk a little bit in detail about uh, uh, other security services which are provided by Cessnet. And on top of that, we have the identity management, PKI and uh, AI, which, which actually means, the, for example, the Eduro one access to the network, the authenticated, the federated identity, so users can use their identities from their organization to access all the services. They do not need to create the Cessnet accounts or anything like that. And on the second, uh, on, on next two slides, uh, they, they just divide these services in two big groups. And one is the, the complementary services, which are part of the member fees of, of the members of the Cessnet, and they are for free. And I think there, there is, uh, it's quite a lot of uh, services from high performance computing to access to all the, uh, the computational side within the Czech Republic, even outside the Czech Republic through the European grid infrastructure. There are storage services, several petabytes available for all the partners. There are collaboration services, which means the video conferencing, even 
the SysNet is able to provide uh, the, the consultation with which hardware to, to, to buy and how to build the proper video conferencing uh, meeting rooms and these kind of things and also provides the a uh, couple of services uh, like the MCU and Adobe Connect and these kind of services. So, so us users just just click and log in via the federated login and can use these services. Of course, there are some infrastructure services like anti-spam. It was mentioned here the, the washing machine for 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 the mails, uh, DNS net network, uh, the precision time network, uh, and much more. The, this security and identities. We are providing the uh, the, uh, the knowledge in the security teams how to build the security team. So some of the universities in Czech Republic already built their own security team, and uh, this has has one. So it it covers all the, all the Czech Republic uh, academic institutions. Uh, we also provide the federated identity uh, infrastructure. Uh, there are also some tools which uh, provide the monitoring so, so the partners can, can request to be monitored by the central monitoring systems. And of course, there are some part of training, uh, especially in the security area. And there are a list of paid services, which are some kind of extra, which must be paid an extra. So the, we provide the national international end-to-end -end services, which means to, to uh, provide the direct connection between infrastructures and uh, organizations. Uh, guaranteed data backup and ar archiving, which is on top of the normal storage services, but if, if you need to be sure that the data will be properly backed and archived, then you need uh, to sign the SLA with, with the SysNet, and there are, must be some additional, uh, there are some additional costs on top of that. We have the virtualization platform, which doesn't mean that we are not providing any virtualization platform for free, but uh, we are providing just basic one, but if you need more, then you need to pay. Uh, licenses and software, uh, we are trying to buy the academic software, well, by the Cessnet itself. So, so the Cessnet will buy the software, the, the Mathematica and these kind of uh, Gaussian tools used for, for, for research. And then they are provided to, 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 the, to the institution, just they, they can, the researchers can ju just use it. They do not need to uh, create any, uh, any agreement with the with the owner of the of the software or uh, anything like that, so so that's that's much easier for the researchers to use that software, and also this software is installed on our high performance computing facilities, so they can just log in into the machines and start using that software. We also have the forensics laboratory, so in case of some security incident, you can let your machine be analyzed by the forensics laboratory. They are also providing the penetrating testing, so uh, you can let your services to be checked whatever they are okay from the security point of view. And we also have some software which has been developed by Cessnet and it's uh, provided by, so, so you, can, you can buy the, the, the installation and the deployment. There is the panel identity management system and, and uh, access management system, FTAS and G3, they are monitoring system for large networks and Nagio Signica system for, for the local monitoring. Uh, that's all, that's all about Cessnet from me. Thank you for attention, and if there are any questions. Thanks, Umtha. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mohammed Nawar Al Awa. He is from uh, Esqua in Lebanon, and uh, more precisely from uh, Technology for Development Division. So he will give us a uh, speak about um, e-infrastructure enabler for sustainable development in the Arab region. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and also thank you for the organizers uh, to invite me to be here uh, in this event. I will take you on a journey in the world of development outside megabytes and gigabytes. So, so I hope it will be uh, fun. So I will be focusing on the three uh, main points in my presentation. Uh, just a brief descri description about ESQA, then I will speak about the development agenda uh, 2030. Then uh, finally, I will speak about uh, the role of e infrastructure in achieving uh, this development agenda. Uh, so as uh, it was mentioned maybe in the, uh, the opening uh, session uh, today, 
uh, there was uh, ESQA is one of five regional commissions uh, uh, related to United Nations. We were established in 1973 as ECWA, uh, Economic Commission then. Uh, the name was changed to ESQA uh, as Economic and uh, Social Commission uh, for Western Asia. Uh, our objective is to enhance cooperation, socioeconomic uh, cooperation between uh, uh, Arab countries. Uh, so we have a lot of initiatives and programs uh, launched at uh, national, uh, sub-regional and uh, regional level. Uh, our headquarter is uh, in Beirut, but also the headquarter moved uh, from Beirut to Baghdad and then to Amman due to security conditions. But since 1997, we returned back to uh, Beirut. We have 18 Arab countries in, uh, uh, in me as members. And last year, uh, Mauritania has joined ESQA. And we hope that uh, we will reach 22 uh, Arab countries in the near future. Uh, internally, we have uh, several sections. Um, each section is dedicated to a special topic. For example, we, are, uh, we have a division for uh, sustainable development, another one for social, uh, economic, and uh, actually I'm working uh, in the division of technology for development. Uh, in addition to our regular activities, such as studies reports that we are providing to, to Arab countries, also we are uh, implementing what we call technical cooperation program and uh, in this program we are providing uh, free of charge advisory services and we are also conducting uh, work, uh, capacity building work uh, workshops to all Arab uh, countries um, some topics uh, that are um, in which we are interested in government innovation uh, incubators technology transfer and uh, other things these are some examples of our advisory services that we provided to all our countries. For example, in Lebanon, we uh, assisted uh, the Ministry of Social Affairs in, uh, in conducting the e-readiness assessment. We also uh, assisted Sudan in developing uh, the new uh, e-government portal, and so on. Uh, well, I would like to move also very quickly to describe uh, the 2030 development agenda that was adopted in September 2015 by uh, the leaders of the world. Uh, it was designed on a new paradigm uh, that says that development has to meet the uh, needs of current generation without compromising the needs of future generations. Uh, it has a 3D, three dimensions, social, uh, economic, and uh, environmental, and uh, uh, it aims to achieve a better future for all people by ending poverty, reducing inequalities, and uh, saving the planet. In fact, uh, this new development agenda replaces the old one, uh, which lasted from 2000 till 2015. It was called Millennium Development Goals. Uh, also, uh, these uh, uh, previous development uh, goals, in fact, some of them uh, witnessed some achievement, uh, but others are still uh, unmet on uh, the global level. For example, we uh, witnessed some improvement in poverty, uh, in, in uh, uh, making drinking water available to more people on the, on the world and also in uh, increasing the number of children attending school. However, some targets are still unmet, such as mortality uh, under five, maternal uh, mortality and uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, what about Arab region? Uh, in fact, in the, in the Arab region, only four countries are in the positive uh, zone of, uh, uh, according to MDG Achievement Index. Uh, 14 Arab countries are unfortunately in uh, the negative zone. This means that we need more programs, more initiatives in all Arab countries in order to achieve uh, development and uh, on all levels, in fact. So uh, the new development agenda is here. We started since 2016 uh, uh, and we are also assisting Arab countries in achieving uh, uh, and in implementing this development agenda. Uh, it is designed to be universal, uh, it's based on uh, sustainable development, uh, it, has also, it, it aims to achieve inclusive economic transformations by uh, creating decent jobs, sustainable uh, technologies, and also by focusing on infrastructure. Uh, also, it aims to achieve peace and governance by uh, enforcing law and by building uh, st uh, strong institutions, and finally, of course, it's fit for purpose, which means that it will be adopted according to national needs and national priorities. Uh, this agenda has 17 different goals, and here we are interested in uh, goal four, which is related to education and higher education, and also in, uh, in goal nine, related to uh, innovation and infrastructure, and finally goal 17, 
related to partnerships. And in this goal, we can see also uh, technology, uh, as, uh, which is mentioned, as one means of implementation. Okay, uh, here we, uh, where we stand uh, in uh, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal Index. Again, uh, we, will, we see that uh, Arab region is divided into three groups. We have a group which is uh, the, uh, in good ranking, let's say. We have a group in the middle, and we have uh, some group of countries that are lagging behind. And unfortunately, in this group, we have countries that are facing internal conflicts and wars. So, uh, of course, we cannot make development in such situations. Uh, now, if we would uh, like also to have uh, an idea of, about what's happening in the Arab region, so we can see that an adult literacy rate, uh, we are only five out of seven, so we need to enhance literacy in uh, the Arab region, and this is, could be done, of course, by education, higher education. Uh, if we look at the expenditure on research and development, we see that we cannot exceed 0.7% of, uh, of GDP, which is very low compared to uh, middle income uh, average, which is 1.3, and high income uh, average, which is 2.4%. So we are not spending enough on research and development. If we look at our status in innovation and uh, knowledge generation, also we can see that majority of Arab countries are uh, uh, lagging behind. So we don't have very good ranking in innovation and in knowledge creation. And here we have to foster then higher education, research, and then e-infrastructure. Uh, if we look here at another index related to infrastructure and business innovation environment, we see all just a few countries that have acceptable level of infrastructure and innovation uh, environment. But for the other uh, Arab countries, they are really uh, not in very good position. Well, uh, now we have SDG, we have the Sustainable Development uh, uh, Agenda, and uh, uh, in SDGs, in, in this development agenda, we have a specific goal, which is goal four, related to higher to education in general, including higher education. And we think that e infrastructure could be and could play an important role in uh, supporting education and research. So e-infrastructure could be a platform for innovation development. It could uh, also play a role of uh, uh, linking uh, knowledge generation to uh, society and industry. So I will move to my third point quickly. Uh, uh, so uh, we will, if we go through uh, uh, the sustainable development goals and look at the role of e-infrastructure, we can see, for example, in goal five, which is related to gender equality, uh, we can see that uh, e-infrastructure could be a tool for e-learning, expanding uh, the, uh, the opportunity uh, for of women and girls in education. Uh, so it can uh, uh, allow them to acquire new skills, they can find better jobs, and hopefully also we can, uh, they can access information and resources more easily. If you look at SDG 8, which is related to decent work and economic growth, we think also that e-infrastructure can play uh, an important role in enhancing productivity and competitiveness due to its connectivity. So it can support entrepreneurs and innovators in uh, developing uh, innovative uh, uh, solutions and innovative initiatives that could be hosted by e-infrastructures. So uh, by, this, uh, by this, it can uh, help to, uh, to increase and to uh, improve the skills of, uh, of youth in general, and also to reduce the gap between uh, university and industry. Uh, another goal, which is uh, the goal nine, related to innovation. We can see that uh, the infrastructure in general uh, is one of the main components of any uh, national innovation system. So uh, big, why? Because it is linking all units together, universities, uh, research centers, also industry and uh, uh, commerce uh, entities together. So uh, I think that e-infrastructure can play a role in enhancing the innovation environment in, uh, uh, in the Arab region. So if we take, for example, uh, the Egypt, Egyptian case, uh, we see that the, here we have uh, uh, infrastructure, and the ICT infrastructure can connect also all the main components of research and uh, academia together. Uh, the same case can, we, uh, can be found in Jordan. If we look at Jordan innovative uh, uh, ecosystem, here we can also see that uh, infrastructure uh, can uh, play an important role in enhancing innovation ecosystem. In general, uh, ICT infrastructure uh, will, could improve all economies uh, in uh, developing countries and in developed countries. 
as we can see here on on the curve. So in uh, here, uh, the the row is uh, is pointing to the Arab countries, but also uh, uh, this applies to other uh, economies. So there would be a positive impact of enhancing uh, infrastructure in all economies. Uh, well, I will move uh, because the time is limited. I will move to uh, the final. Uh, goal, which is uh, goal 17. Uh, in goal 17, uh, is related to means of implementation of uh, the development agenda, and uh, it uh, distinguishes between three main uh, means of implementation that are funding, capacity building, and technology. And also, we think that e infrastructure could play a role in fundraising because it can host uh, SDG initiatives, and also it can play a role in networking all stakeholders together. I will move just a few words about recommendations. Um, in expenditure, I think that uh, Arab countries have to uh, increase uh, expenditure on research and development, and it is not a lost uh, uh, expenditure because it could be compensated through uh, creating jobs, through uh, enhancing economic uh, uh, level in, in the country, so it could be uh, compensated through development cycle. Uh, in, uh, in the part related to enabling environment, also we need to look at, uh, at the legal framework, at higher education uh, laws and regulations, and uh, include uh, sustainable development uh, in these uh, laws and, uh, and acts. And also we have to focus on the content because we don't have enough content in Arabic and take advantage of uh, the available resources such as uh, MOOCs and other uh, e-learning uh, uh, modes that are now <coughs> common in, uh, in universities. Uh, final uh, word about coordination. I think also we have, uh, well, uh, we have to focus on e-infrastructure because it could be a tool to break uh, academic silos and make all persons and all stakeholders work together. And also it can improve the dissemination of uh, good practices and share sh uh, lessons learned between uh, Arab universities and Arab countries. Here, we just uh, we can see uh, the role of education and higher education in achieving the SDG. So, we, uh, on this uh, mesh and uh, on this network, we can see that education is really at the core of uh, the new development agenda. So, it can help achieving uh, all other goals. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, expenditure is is important, but it's not the only factor, because in the index, they look at uh, the input and output. So uh, sometimes you have an efficient innovation system, which means that we have low input, so low expenditure, for example, but we have good output, we, uh, which is measured by patents, by uh, publications, and so on. So if the system is efficient, sometimes even with, with low uh, expenditure, we can achieve a good result. But this is good, but what is yeah. Yeah, this is not, yeah, so it's just one factor. It's not, uh, of course, it's not the only indicator. So what is the role of ESCO in this case? And what do you do with governments to, or with countries to motivate this kind of issue? Because this is very critical for the yeah. future generation. Yeah, in fact, we are uh, assisting our countries in developing their national uh, innovation policy. So uh, we are working with all Arab countries, with public, public sector, so we gov with government uh, agencies. So we can assist them in developing, in reviewing, in, uh, in providing, as I said, the advisory services to any uh, agency uh, that thinks that we, uh, uh, they request uh, ESQA assistance. So uh, we can develop uh, a special study for each country, and we can provide recommendations to uh, enhance uh, uh, their national system. Thank you. Uh, no, we have, uh, in fact, we have our, uh, yes. You should make some dissemination, some awareness, some awareness, workshops in the countries uh, to know about uh, your, your activity. Yeah, uh, in fact, we have two things. We have the regular activity, so we have workshops, we have publications, and all, by the way, all our publications are available online for free. Uh, s but... Uh, in addition to that, if any public agency in any Arab country would like to have a specific uh, advisory service on a specific topic, we can also provide that for it. I mean that, uh, that you have to 
you said some letters to Nathan, for example, in Supreme Council of Universities in Egypt. No, no, because uh, we think that uh, it is sort of intervention. <laughs> so if we are requested, we can reply positively, of course. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank your you. presentation. The next speaker is uh, Alexander Van Den He is from Surfnet, the Netherlands MRN. And he will give us... A presentation about the benefits of the advantages. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, indeed, my name is uh, Alexander van der Hill. I'm product manager at, uh, at Surfnet for the network services uh, there. Uh, I want to inform you on the work we did on uh, the advanced North Atlantic 300G uh, facility, uh, a set of, uh, of network links to the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. But first, I want to tell you a bit more about uh, where I come from. Uh, I live in the Netherlands, I work with Surfnet. Uh, Surfnet is a small uh, country in the northwestern part of, uh, of Europe. Uh, we have about uh, 17 million uh, inhabitants. And uh, since the, the, the global age, we are, we are used to work uh, globally, internationally. So, and that's what we, uh, what, what we, still, uh, what we still do. Um, Lars already mentioned that it's, uh, it's, it, it's snowing in, uh, in the northern parts. Uh, in my country it's raining quite often uh, these days, so that might be the reason why I feel uh, at home here in, uh, in Lebanon. Um, Surfnet. Surfnet is a part of the, uh, the surf uh, umbrella organization, so to say. Um, the, the, the Dutch universities, higher education institutes, the research center, the medical uh, uh, centers, they are member of SURF and they own SURF. Um, and b by being member, they steer on what's, uh, what's happening within uh, the, the, the three companies you see here in, uh, in red, uh, green and, 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 uh, and blue. So uh, Sarah is the, the, the supercomputing uh, uh, sister organization of, uh, of Surfnet. Uh, Surf Market is another sister organization that uh, does procurement for, for uh, licenses for cloud services and that kind of, uh, of stuff. Um, and Surfnet is the, uh, the end run of the, of the Netherlands. Uh, we do the network uh, stuff, we, we, do, we also do uh, AI, uh, we do cloud services and that kind of, uh, of services. On, the, on your right, left side, there's also the eScience Center. The eScience Center is, is partly funded uh, by SURF and partly funded by uh, NWO, which is the, 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 the Science Foundation of, of the Netherlands. And typically what they do is help researchers out with using ICT services. So they combine the services of SURF SARA, of SURF Market and SURFnet into useful tools for, uh, for, for the researchers. Back to uh, Surfnet, uh, we, we connect uh, 180 institutes uh, in, in the Netherlands with about 1 million uh, end users and these are students and staff from the, from, from the universities um, and in our country uh, we have uh, for the size of our country quite a big fiber, uh, fiber network from approximately uh, 13,000 uh, kilometers straight into these uh, 180 institutes. Uh, we provide them with, with internet connectivity from 1 gig to 100 gig capacity. We do both IPv4 and IPv6. We will also give them uh, the ability to set up dedicated circuits between uh, these, these, these uh, institutes. And it's useful for research projects. But it's also useful for, for connecting to cloud providers on a, on, on a secured uh, uh, way. Um, yeah, and, and we don't do that only nationally. We all with cross-border fibers uh, and Géant and connections to Netherlight and M6 and the Bel Belgium Internet Exchange. We, we, we connect to uh, to our parties uh, abroad. Um, and a quite big partner uh, is is Glyph. You see here uh, the Glyph map uh, where all the the participants in Glyph. Cliff is the global Lambda integrated facility where, where entrants uh, in the world uh, work together. What they've done here, they, they draw their uh, uh, global connections into this, this map. And again, you can see that, that the Netherlands is 
is quite a, a, a central point here uh, here in the in the lower map. Um, but as you can see, it's quite a, a spaghetti. Everybody is doing it on their uh, on their own thing, and that's why uh, we're working. And Lars mentioned it already working on uh, a global network architecture. And I, I, I need to say that the global network architecture is, is not a network itself. It's not a single organization uh, that runs, but it works on, on structuring how to work internationally together. So um, GNA aims to describe in architecture documents uh, the, the, the terminology, the key elements, as, as the, the links and the open exchanges that are operated by uh, the different parties. Uh, it, it describes the technology used. Um, it describes the cost sharing, how you, how you share the cost of these uh, these links, and it also describes how you work together in in, in operating this, uh, this 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 global RNE uh, network. Um, that bootstrapping this this architecture is not very easy. And it's about the same time uh, that we, we, we started this GNA. That we also, uh, together with, with, with partners here in the, in the right, Nordinet, Canary, Internet2, Shayland, ESnet, and my company, Surfnet, we wanted to push the envelope uh, on transatlantic uh, capacity. At that time, there were about 25 10G connections through the, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and we want to see if it's possible to, to build a 100G uh, circuit. Um, the, the, the drawing here uh, shows uh, a map of how we, we've built this 100 gig uh, circuit. And the aim was uh, to have it up and running at the Torino Networking Conference um, in 2013 in Maastricht. Um, it was a close call, but we made it the evening before it was up and running. Um, and, and, and after that, uh, that demo in, in Maastricht, uh, we, we, we wanted to bring this in, uh, in production. So uh, in May 2012, we got a first ID, and in October 2013, it was fully in production uh, w with the two open exchanges. As Lars said, these are key elements uh, for the global network uh, architecture. With an open exchange in New York, uh, it's run by uh, Internet2 and it's called Menlen. And uh, in Amsterdam, uh, it's terminated at uh, the Netlight Open Exchange um, and it's run by, by, by Surfnet. Um, quite uh, soon after that, um, we saw that when, when, when a, in a, a transatlantic cable breaks, it takes about uh, three weeks to repair it. Um, so in order to have a production uh, facility, we, need a, we needed a second one. Um, so uh, we sat together uh, with the partners, Nordinet, Internet2, Canary uh, and Surfnet at that time, and we wanted to, uh, to procure uh, a second link to provide a resiliency uh, among this, uh, this system. Um, and we did that in uh, June 2014. And when that was, uh, was ready, we were able to seize the, the existing uh, 10G services. So all the 10G services at that time were migrate, migrated um, to, to the new system. Um, in the meantime, uh, Shayan decided to, uh, to acquire another uh, 100 gig link. And uh, in spring uh, of this year, they decided to, 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 to join the ANA consortium and add it to the, the facility. facility. Uh, so uh, we now have 300G uh, links across the transatlantic, uh, uh, the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, and to provide uh, another bit of uh, resiliency, we are working now on uh, uh, bringing one of the third links to, uh, to Montreal. So we have three exchange points in Europe and three exchange ports in, 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 in Northern America. So this, this is this fully up and, uh, up and running now. Um, and we, 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 we learned a lot about this. We used also this, this project as a pathfinder for, uh, for, for GNA uh, to see what we have to describe in this, in this architecture uh, documents. And the, the, the most important thing we, uh, we learned is uh, that you, uh, you have to trust uh, your, your partners. Um, Without um, the, the, this trust, 
uh, we wouldn't have been able to, to do this. Um, for example, when we started this, uh, this project, uh, we didn't write a letter down in MOUs or something. Uh, we just trusted the partners that we were able uh, to do this and, uh, and make this to a good, uh, good end. Um, so you have to trust each other on operations. You have to trust each other on making equipment available. You have to trust each other on the cost sharing. Internet 2, for example, took the first bill and they trusted us that we were going to cost share uh, this link later, uh, later on. Um, so I can't stress enough that you, that you have to find good partners uh, uh, here. The second thing uh, we learned is that this facility is also very beneficial for uh, other partners, not only for, for Canary, Internet2, Xeon, uh, Servnet and, and Nordunet, but we also saw that, that the, the presence of Internet2 in Amsterdam and in London and in Paris was also useful for you guys. So uh, many entrants in the region uh, connected to Amsterdam and to London to peer there with, with, with Internet2. So it makes uh, international connectivity uh, at once far more efficient. And you can see it here in this side. It's, it's, it gives you an overview of which parties are connected to, uh, to, to Netherlight nowadays. Um, at the upper left part, the, the open exchanges around uh, the world. And on the upper uh, right part, all the entrants uh, that, are, that are connected uh, right now. And each and every party, party connected can uh, exchange traffic within, uh, within Netherlight without extra cost or, uh, or extra agreements uh, for that. Um, the third thing is that you also need efficient uh, connectivity between the, uh, the open exchange points. So Lars already uh, pointed this out. What we did in, in Europe uh, with, with, with Endrance, uh, we shared our fiber system there. Um, so, for example, uh, Nordinet bought a link from, uh, or brought a fiber system uh, between Amsterdam and London, and uh, Servnet operates uh, the optical system uh, on that. On the, uh, another example is the, the link between Hamburg and, and Geneva here. Uh, we swapped the spectrum. Um, Servnet uses uh, the link uh, which goes directly from Hamburg to Geneva via Frankfurt. Which we, on which we used uh, the Polish spectrum, and exchange, in exchange for that, uh, we give the, our Polish uh, colleagues uh, spectrum on our link. And by that, we don't have to uh, invest in, in, uh, in fiber systems uh, twice. And we're also able to interconnect these, uh, these exchange points very, uh, very efficiently and uh, lower the cost for, uh, for that. Um, that's basically what I wanted to say to you today. Thanks, Alexander. The next speaker is Adwan Moussa from Tata Communications. So please, you will give us a speak about uh, pushing the limits on research and education with the cloud. Oh, okay, sorry. that's easy. Yeah, thanks. That's okay. Hi, good afternoon, uh, everyone. For those who don't know me here, uh, my name is Radwan Musali and I represent Tara Communications. Uh, Tara Communication has been associated with the r &E community for probably the last uh, 25 years, if not more, from the Teglo Canada days. I've got uh, my ex-colleague here, Eve Pop, who spoke earlier today. Uh, you might have seen also some of the links from my uh, colleague who just spoke. There are several links that uh, crosses the Atlantic as well as the Pacific and intra-Europe says TGN and that stands for Tata Global Network because we own and operate the largest submarine cable system. Uh, I didn't want to use a PowerPoint because uh, I think what have been said so far is uh, uh, enough uh, coverage with regards to how important the r and &E, uh, is to our community uh, globally as well as in this part uh, of the world. And again, I don't want to use a PowerPoint because uh, I don't want to 
call this session as death by PowerPoint. <laughs> we've, got, uh, we've had enough PowerPoint this afternoon. My, my only five cents when it comes here is we've been in this part of the world, we have been trying to really advance uh, and enhance the quality of education, which we all believe that it is very important for the next generation, for our kids, for our uh, children, and so forth. And our colleague from uh, uh, the ESCO spoke earlier how important it is and what are the implications when you improve the quality of education for, for the generation. And I think for the last probably six years or seven years since ASHRIN was established, there have been multiple attempts where we really want to advance these uh, uh, national research and education networks. And excuse my apologies, I had a three pages speech here, but I'm not gonna use it because I really, the speakers, the earlier speakers got me really excited. So I'm, I'm doing it right from my heart and I represent myself here when I speak few things. Uh, now, the previous speakers have spoken and showed us how beautiful those networks are, how advanced, how sophisticated. Who is benefiting from this, right? Now, the way I look at it, I don't think this part of the world lack the talent, the knowledge, the desire of people, whether within the education and research institutes, or students, or children, kids at school, they don't have the desire to get access to all these, uh, all kind of, of, of that data and research that are available uh, to everybody else in the world, right? We've, some, we've seen Sweden connected to Denmark, Denmark connected to the US, US is connected to Canada, and so forth. So my question to Asrin here is, why we are not part of this journey, what do we really need to do to be part of this global ecosystem, right, and take advantage of this. Now, we keep saying that the cost of connectivity in this part of the world is expensive, right, because, let's face it, it is a not uh, fully deregulated uh, environment when it comes to the telecom industry, and that's where I come from, so excuse my ignorance, I'm not a scientific, scientist nor a politician, but I'm taking things from more from practical perspective. So because our environment, the, the, the regulatory environment of our uh, region is not fully deregulated, uh, and of course we, we sit somewhere in this globe where Connectivity is expensive from distance perspective, from infrastructure investment perspective. I think, and I, I insist, that the mandate of ASRAN under the, 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 the patronage of the Arab League should really be lobbying at the highest level with regards to getting access to cost-effective connectivity for the Arab world to be part of this beautiful networks that we have just seen. I think this is, this is the mandate of everyone who represent ASRIN, and I happen to be a founding member uh, uh, in, in that uh, uh, forum, which was signed back in, on, I still remember, on the 10th of December 2010 in the Arab League building in Cairo. And I was under the impression that this was the mandate, because to pursue these kind of initiatives, it has to happen from top down. Otherwise, it will never happen, right? Now, but do we, do we sit and wait for another seven years since the ASRIN was established to basically contribute to the next generation in this part of the world? Or do we try to find alternative ways at least to provide basic services related to the R&E community uh, till, till somehow uh, uh, the, the, the connectivity part gets resolved? And people realize that this is as important as infrastructure in any country in this part of the world, just like the way we build universities or schools or highways or, or electricity and so forth, right? So in my earlier uh, 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 context, I was strongly recommending that we really have to start looking into moving some of these services up to the cloud. Right? So there are basic services, and I have seen 
this from many of the speakers who spoke earlier today, that there are lots of services, they started offering things over the cloud, which basically means that I can access these services over the cloud using the public internet, right? And obviously, there are so many business applications that over the last three, four years have, have moved to the, to, the, to the cloud, right? If we look at Microsoft, we look at Google, if we look at Amazon, if we look at uh, SFDC, SAP, etc., it's already over the cloud. So what does really prevent us from moving these services over the cloud and, and create some sort of a governing rules for those scientific research indication users to access this? If I look at it from corporate perspective, today, we have moved our uh, email servers or email service from on-premise up to using Microsoft Office 365, right? And obviously, I can access my email from anywhere in the world, right, in a very cost-effective manner. And as a result of this, I don't really need to have a 10 meg or 20 meg or 30 meg or even 10 gig dedicated for me to access uh, these kind of details. The same thing when we look at Amazon, when we look at uh, 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 Google with these uh, virtual machines for, for processing and high power and so forth. And I think the level of security that has been created today when it comes to these managed services, whether it is service, whether it is processing, whether it is storage, the level of security that has been created today can guarantee to a certain extent that this, the integrity of the data and obviously the security of the data, and it's only available for those students or research who really need to use it. So, what I'm trying to say here is that either we move and at least try to uh, move with what, what's happening around us with regards to the dynamic, the advancements of, of the technology that allows us to uh, overcome any constraint related to cost and connectivity and provide with basic services and then therefore move into the, the, the cloud. <laughs> or we simply sit down and keep try, uh, praying to God that the cost of connectivity in this part of the world will come down and then we miss the wagon. In my objective, as professionals, whether from the r and &E community, whether it's from Astrin, whether from the telecommunication uh, community, I think in this part of the world, I have multiple citizenship, but I'm talking as, 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 as a member of this part of the world, and I, I see how my kids have grown up, how my kids got educated overseas. They all graduated from Canada, and uh, uh, I'm very proud father of, of great children who graduated from great uh, university, who got great jobs, etc. But I'm just trying to see if they had to basically stay within in those certain countries where there is limited access to these kind of details, right? There's a big difference, right? So my, my conclusion here is I think by the time we get into a resolution for, 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 for the connectivity part, as, as Asrin, we really have to start looking into these alternative uh, ways on how to make these uh, valuable R&E uh, uh, connectivity available over the cloud. And I think today it is doable. Uh, I'll be more than happy to contribute putting a solution altogether as a hybrid solution and present it. And I tell you what, the cost of moving these up to the, to the cloud would probably be a fraction of what an STM1 costs in certain parts of the world uh, uh, here. With that, I, I wanted to wake you up after lunch, so I didn't want to use a paper. I just wanted to express my feeling here, and I, I, I really uh, congratulate all the colleagues who, who spoke earlier. This is very impressive to see you know, how advanced these networks are, and I'm sure with the effort of uh, ASRIN, we will, we will get there. I don't think there is really much time left for us because otherwise we're missing the wagon. Uh, so let's go, get going. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to Radwan Musali to, to giving us your approach. Uh, I think it's uh, a practical uh, approach and some countries can, can follow it. Uh, 
I don't know if there is another questions for our speakers. Salam, <laughs> eleventh. Okay, so if there is no question, I thanks all the speakers for their presentation, and uh, we have break now, so it's finished for this session. Thank you.